Good evening. <clears throat> we are in Philippians again, getting close to the end of Paul's letter, this last of the four chapters of Paul writing to the church at Philippi. Entitled this part of the lesson, Remain in, in the Lord. Paul's giving some final exhortations as he's sort of wrapping up the letter and uh, giving some uh, exhortations on being united and being joyous in the Lord and on what we ought to be focusing on in our minds. Of course, how we ought to uh, focus our minds on the things of Christ. And really, a lot of these things are uh, themes we've already seen in the letter. He's just continuing to repeat and maybe bring to application and uh, finality here in the letter. So as we think about uh, the three points that I want to kind of break it out into as we remain in the Lord, or Paul is encouraging us to remain in the Lord, I'm encouraging you to remain in the Lord, encouraging myself to remain in the Lord. Uh, we need to be seeking unity in the Lord and rejoicing in the Lord and setting our minds on the things of the Lord. And so those are some of those themes we've had, the theme of unity in this letter, the theme of joy. Joy is probably the one we usually think about with the letter of the Philippians. But there's also been this repeated idea brought throughout the letter about our minds, that our mind be conformed to the mind of Christ, conforming our minds to, to thinking on those spiritual things. So let's jump into our text in Philippians chapter 4 and uh, kind of put verse 1 with the previous lesson. So we'll start in verse 2, Philippians 4 verses 2 through 9. I urge you, Odia, and I urge Syntyche, to think the same way in the Lord. Indeed, I ask you also, genuine companion, help these women who have contended together alongside of me in the gospel, with also Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, rejoice. Let your considerate spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is dignified, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, consider these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. All right, so those first verses focus on this idea of seeking unity in the Lord. And we have, as a, I guess, as a case study, these, these ladies, these sisters in the church, Euodia and Syntyche. I think that's how you pronounce those aren't really names that we encounter that often today. Euodia and Syntyche, he's asking them to, to think the same way and in the Lord, right? So this has mostly been a positive letter as we've gone through it, uh, focusing on things like joy, those sorts of ideas, unity, and uh, conforming our minds to Christ, as we've talked about and we'll talk about in this lesson. Uh, and those are all worthwhile uh, admonitions for us to have, you know, to have joy and have unity and have the mind of Christ in us. But perhaps rather than just being an abstract treatise of, hey, here are good things that I'm bringing up for no reason, perhaps Paul had an occasion to write this letter. And some have suggested that the occasion for this letter was this conflict between Euodia and Syntyche. I don't know if that, maybe that's making too much of the case of that, but nevertheless, a situation was apparently going on. These, these, uh, these sisters, sisters in Christ, Euodia and Syntyche, fellow workers uh, in Christ, 
had some sort of trouble getting along. And they were not thinking the same way in the Lord. We don't really know exactly what all that meant. Were they having some fight over, you know, some theological topic or something? Nevertheless, it, it, it rose to the point that Paul addressed it publicly in this letter for all of us to, to see and all of the church in Philippi to have read that letter when they first received it. Oh, Paul's mentioning Euodia and Syntyche here, these sisters, you know, in, in the congregation there with them. That may have been surprising or maybe not surprising. They would have known what, this, what the backstory was with this. And, and perhaps this was in the mind of Paul as he wrote this letter. I don't want to make too much of a case out of it, but, but just consider that as he's telling them to, to think the same way in the Lord here in verse 2. We can think back to chapter 1 in verse 27 where, where Paul says there, uh, only live your lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come to see you or, or am absent, I will hear about your circumstances that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind contending together for the faith of the gospel. And I think as we read through that the first time, as we were looking at chapter 1, we're just thinking, well, Paul's just talking about the, the church in general and how uh, they ought to be remain in one spirit. But again, now that he's sort of developed to this point where he's addressing maybe a, a falling short of that with these two particular sisters, perhaps that's why he was making this case all along. We should stand firm in one spirit, with one mind, and contending together. Not, not fighting together like we're fighting against one another, but contending together, fighting for the gospel to share and to stand for truth together. And in chapter 2, we can also think in Philippians 2, chapter 2, verses 2 and following, where Paul says, Fulfill my joy that you think the same way. By maintaining the same love, being united in spirit, thinking on one purpose, doing nothing from selfish ambition or vainglory, but with humility of mind, regarding one another as more important than yourselves. Perhaps, I'm speculating, perhaps Euodia and Syntyche were not thinking of each other as more important than themselves. Not merely looking out for your own interests, but also the interest of others. Have this way of thinking in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Of course, then in the following verses, Paul expounds more about, uh, about Christ and how we should be like him. Now, if we go back to our text here in chapter 4 and verse 3, you know, it's not apparently not always been a problem, whatever this conflict is, has not always been a problem. As we look at verse 3, it says, Indeed, I ask you, also genuine companion, help these women who have contended together alongside of me in the gospel. They have in the past been co-workers in some level with, with Paul, with also Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. And so we can think of these fellow workers. He mentions Clement. We could think of Timothy, who is mentioned in this letter, and uh, Silas and Barnabas, uh, Epaphroditus, who's mentioned in this letter, Priscilla and Aquila, different people who are said to have helped Paul in his, in his efforts to share the gospel. Euodia and Syntyche are in that list as well, but, but they've come into some sort of conflict now. They are faithful Christians uh, all of these fellow workers are faithful Christians whose names are in the book of life. We certainly want that to be true of us as well. Now, at the beginning of this verse, it talks about, you know, I, I ask you also, genuine companion. We might wonder who that is. Is he addressing some, you know, Yodia and Syntyche are sitting over here, and then the genuine companion, you're over there. You know, there's some other specific person, you know, hey, you, you're, you're, you're a faithful worker. Help them. Help support them. <laughs> Whether he's being specific or you know, addressing the church in general. Uh, these, these ladies perhaps need some help uh, to get along, and the church needs to, to pull together and help support those, those two sisters to get along. We might say these sisters needed to be re-centered on this concept of unity. You know, and we might ask ourselves, do, do we? Do we perhaps have issues with unity? Uh, I don't <coughs> see any 
big problem with that myself, but different different ones of us, maybe we see, oh, I, maybe I'm falling short of that, or you know, different conflicts we might have that we don't all see. This is a good lesson for us. It's not just, we don't be focused on Yodi and Sintiki, but how does it apply to us? Are we having the unity we should have with each other, being united in one mind in the Lord? And he goes on to focus on rejoicing in the Lord. Again, another one of the themes of the letter. In verse 4, he goes on to just say, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. It's very emphatic. He's re repeating this here. This a good, a good general exhortation. We should be rejoicing. We have such priceless blessings in Christ. Certainly, we should rejoice. And, and my mind goes again, well, maybe though, here in this portion of the letter, is he still kind of maybe directing that uh, to whatever this conflict with Yodia and Syntyche is? Um, whatever they're being at odds about, uh, perhaps they need to rejoice and recognize the, the common salvation that they share, that we all share, and recognize uh, that we should be getting along, we should be of one mind in Christ. So rejoice, and again I say rejoice. And of course we see this sort of idea proclaimed in the letter earlier. We can look back in chapter 1 again, of Philippians 1, verse 3 and following. He says, I thank my God with all remembrance of you, always offering my prayer with joy in my every prayer for you. And of course, remember in that context, he's in prison, but he's thanking God, making every prayer with joy for them. Because of your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And again, you think that fellowship in the gospel, well, these fellow workers, Yodi and Syntyche, have always been contending with Paul helping share the gospel. We need to keep on keeping on. Rejoice in the Lord. Also in Philippians 1, verse 18, that portion of the letter where he was talking about the preachers with bad motives who were kind of out to get Paul. But uh, he, he says then, you know, well, what then? In verse 18, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this, I rejoice. And yes, I will rejoice. He says that again, that double rejoice thing again like he does here in verse chapter 4, verse 4. But do we have that joy in our lives? And maybe we do have struggles with this or that in our life, but do we have joy in our lives in the Lord as, as with regard to recognizing the spiritual blessings we have in Christ? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Let that be uh, directed to us that we should have lives full of joy in the Lord. In verse 5, let your considerate spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. You know that the idea, and this is a generally positive letter, that the, the church is doing well there in Philippi. Uh, keep on keeping on, right? Let your considerate spirit be known. You're, 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 a, you're a, a church of joy. Let people see Christ living in you. And maybe going back to Yodi and Syntyche, you know, don't let this Yodia and Syntyche conflict, whatever it is, don't let that redefine you from this joyous church to this, oh, we're a conflict-ridden church. You know, resolve it. Help, help those sisters and, and grow the church and heal that together so that you can be, have this reputation of, of having a considerate spirit to others, to be known as a loving, considerate, faithful church. And then this last part, the Lord is near, uh, perhaps a warning, perhaps an encouragement, right? Maybe both. Uh, the Lord is near. Be, be serious about being right with God. But also, the Lord is near. He's, he's coming for your salvation. It won't be very long, those sorts of things. And then in verse, um, verse 6, I seem to have failed to put that in my in my slides here. But verse 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So we talked about that in our class this morning about the danger of worry, anxiety. Don't be worried about stuff. But instead, pray. Bring it to God. Uh, prayer and petition and thanksgiving are just really just three ways to say ways we should be praying to God, bringing those things to Him. Let our requests be made known to God. How is God, God going to know our requests? Because we're, we're bringing to them, them to Him in prayer. 
And in verse uh, 7 here, And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we think about the peace of God. Of course, that would map in Hebrew to shalom, the characteristic greeting of the Jewish people historically. If we are in Christ, we are no longer in conflict with Christ. We have the peace of God. We have all spiritual blessings in Christ. We have the hope of eternal life. It's so good. It's beyond words how good that is, that we have these blessings in Christ. And of course, uh, the question would be, do you have this peace? You know, do we all recognize this peace? Are we, do we have the right relationship with God to where uh, we have the peace of God rather than fearful or some sort of conflict with God? We want you to have that, that peace, with, peace of God. It surpasses all comprehension. It's beyond words. It's, it's good. It's what we want. It's what we're blessed to have. And then another theme that we're just continuing on, uh, setting your minds on the Lord, this, this idea of, uh, of our mind and our thinking and having our, our mind conformed to Christ. In verse 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is dignified, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, consider these things or think on these things. And so that's interesting that that's sort of at the end of the list is what we're supposed to do with these. So, let's, so think on these things, consider these things, have these things in your mind. Well, what things? All these things in this list. So maybe just take a moment to, to dig into these lists. The things that are true, so as opposed to false lies, right? True things. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, in the life, no one comes to the Father but through me. In John 14, Paul tells us that God cannot lie when he wrote to Titus in chapter 1. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. There's, there's this difference between truth and lies, right? We should be focused on, on what is true. We should value what is true. And, and of course, you know, we... We're thinking about the context of the Bible, but even in whatever context in life, um, maybe we're having an argument with someone about politics or COVID or what, whatever contentious thing we might have an argument about or have a discussion about. Maybe it's not worth arguing about, but, but do we value winning the argument or do we value what's true? Are we going to try to win an argument sacrificing truth? If that's what we're doing, we need to change that. We need to focus on truth and valuing truth. Not necessarily on winning, but on truth. Consider and think on truth. Then this next part, I, my translation has the word dignified. Some translations talk about things that are noble or honest or honorable. You know, might think the opposite of smut in the media things like that. You know, we don't want to celebrate the corruption of marriages and how, how that ought to be. We should embrace God's plan, think on those things. We should celebrate faithful living and faithful wives and husbands, obedient children, honest workers, honest, uh, honest salesmen. Maybe that's a contradiction in our culture. Honest lawyers, right? People that maybe have this reputation of being Shady and shifty. They don't have to be if they focus on being noble and dignified and honest and honorable. Things that are appropriate and respectful behavior is what's talked about here. That's what we should be considering and thinking and meditating on. The next one on the list is what is right. If there's anything that is right or just, some translations will say. Those kind of come from the same Greek word with justification and righteousness. Those, those ideas are, are the, same, the same root. It's rightness as opposed to what is wrong or wicked. We should think about people who stand for truth as good examples. Think about the right things and right living, righteous living, faithfulness. 
having the right relationship with God and man. Loving God and loving man would be things we could think about with an idea of right. And then the word pure uh, have a definition of with, without moral defect or without blemish. So quite simply good things. You know, maybe as opposed to dirty jokes or something on the other side of the coin. We would want to be focused on uh, good things, pure things. Things that are lovely, this is, uh, maybe we would use the word beauty. Things that, that cause others to be pleased. Things that are delightful to others. Kindness and goodness and gentleness and generosity. Those sorts of ideas may come to mind with lovely. And the things that are commendable, Things of good report, I think the King James says, or things that are admirable. Things that are deserving approval and have a good reputation. They're worthy of praise and approval. And really, a lot of these just kind of blur together into good. Think about good things is kind of what he's saying. The next one is excellence or virtue. It comes from a, a Greek word, arte, which when I was at Florida College, that was the society I was in and we had a shirt that says Arte on the back to kind of remind us of this concept of Christian virtue and excellence. That we should be above and beyond doing, doing good things to honor the Lord. So think about people who do nice things for other people, kindness. Again, some of these repeated ideas about just being good. Anything worthy of praise. Maybe this is a catch-all. Anything worthy of praise. Anything like praiseworthy. Anything to be praised. <clears throat> We're able to speak of the excellence of a person. We're praising them for the goodness and the dignity and the rightness and the purity and all of these other things are things worthy to be praised. So, so all of those things, we should be considering those things and focusing our mind and thinking on those things as we conform our mind to be more like Christ. And then not just thinking about those things, but, but putting them into practice here in, in verse 9. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. So all of those, you've, you've learned them, you've received them, you've heard them because Paul preached them to you. You've seen them in Paul's manner of life. Practice those things. Put those things into application and practice. Things we read in the scriptures, right? Faithful people that we see here in this congregation. Practice those things. And the peace of God will be with you. And again, we have that, that peace of God as opposed to enmity. We're, we shouldn't be in conflict with God. We should be in fellowship with God. So it's a little bit of a shorter lesson this evening than this morning. So remain in the Lord. Paul's giving that admonition to the Philippians, perhaps specifically to Euodia and Syntyche, but certainly to the whole congregation, certainly to us. Lessons for us to remain in the Lord, to seek unity in the Lord, if we have some sort of conflicts, let's work those things out and let's help others, just as the, the good companion was told to help those, those sisters, to help work those things out. Our lives should be characterized by joy. Even, even Paul in prison is, is characterized by joy. So whatever struggles we're going through, we should still recognize the blessings we have in Christ and rejoice in the Lord. And then all those good things that we took the time to focus on, set our minds on those things of the Lord. Now I'll leave that big old list of things here for you as our verse I like to leave up. Uh, verse, verse 8. Whatever, whatever is true, whatever is dignified, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, consider these things. So the question for us, you know, what are we focused on? day to day. Are, are we considering those things or are we kind of caught up in whatever trends and things that maybe are contrary to that? You know, are we putting God first? Is there anything we can do to help you this evening to be closer to the Lord or right with the Lord? If anyone needs to obey the gospel or need the prayers of the church or would like to come forward for any reason, we would welcome you to do that. The question is asked in our song number 39, we're going to sing, Is Thy Heart Right With God? Is your heart right with God? We hope so. If we can help you, come as we stand and sing the song.